Welcome to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum Zoom series, Trolleyology. My name is Kristen Fredrickson, and I am the manager of public programs and outreach here at the museum. Thank you so much for joining us today, and welcome back to those of you who have joined us for previous programs. This virtual series features programs on Pennsylvania transit history topics, stories of the trolley era, uh, and our collection that you can experience from home, usually on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, once or twice a month. And we're gonna continue these regularly. So if you have a show or a presentation that you would like to share that fits our museum mission, please let me know. Uh, that would be anything about Pennsylvania, the trolley era, cities where our streetcars come from, and if you have a program that doesn't quite fit those guidelines, please reach out anyway. You can see a full list of our upcoming presentations at our website, patrolley.org. And I want to extend a very special thank you to those of you who donated when registering for tonight's program. And those of you who have made donations through our website this year. We really, really appreciate your support of our virtual outreach programs. Um, and then we did have a couple questions tonight about where to make that donation when registering because our ticketing system has changed recently. Um, right now it's a free input donation, but uh, we're going to change it so that you can select an amount or put in whatever you'd like. So thank you very much for your patience with the new system. We'll get that all worked out shortly. Okay, so for those of you uh, who are new to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum, we were established in 1954 as the Arden Electric Railway by a group of trolley enthusiasts called the Pittsburgh Electric Railway Club, and the museum opened to visitors just a few years later in 1963, and is actually located along the route of the former interurban line between Washington and Pittsburgh. Washington, PA, that is. Here you'll find over 50 trolleys and electric railway cars, about 20 of which operate, and we get about 30,000 visitors or more per year that take the four-mile scenic ride at the museum. And we are open Friday through Sunday over the winter this year. We've had some snowy weekends so far, but um, we are open. So if you are local, you can come see us, come ride a trolley uh, and see what we've got to offer in our new Welcome and Education Center. And uh, like I mentioned a couple minutes ago, we recently had our 70th anniversary on February 7th of the first cars arriving at the museum. And you can see two of them there on the photo on the left with uh, most of the folks who came out that evening, including Art Ellis there in the center, 104 years old. And um, on the right, we had a nice little cake too. <laughs> so thank you guys again for your support, uh, whether you've been around the museum for seven days or 70 years. Uh, another cool thing we did recently, you can see in my background photo and a couple of these photos, uh, the Mount Lebanon, um, the cast of Upcoming Meet Me in St. Louis came out to shoot their cast photo at the museum. And uh, one of our talented volunteers, Tom Polish, took these photos and kind of edited them old style. Um, so you see them standing here in their costumes on the open car. Uh, it was really, really neat. And uh, some of the some of the high schoolers even had trolley connections as well. So that was pretty neat to hear. And they're all theater students. So they're like very animated and they're running all over the place. So it was a lot of fun to see them experience the museum. And uh, lastly, I did wanna mention, we have the West Penn Trolley Meet coming up this year. It's June 7th and 8th with an optional light rail excursion with uh, Pittsburgh Regional Transit on June 9th. So uh, you can visit our website. I'll put this link in the chat as well. We would love to have all of our out-of-towners come, especially if you haven't had a chance to see the new building yet. Um, there's going to be um, everything from night photo shoots to trolley parades and vendor tables. Um, and that's actually happening at the same time as the Hoosier Traction Meet this year. So um, the Hoosier Traction Meet is a group that kind of focuses on long form historical presentations. And um, there's going to be some really great stuff there too. So patrolley.org slash West Penn Trolley Meet with dashes between all those words. I'll put the link in the chat shortly. Okay, and now we're gonna get into today's presentation with our presenter, George Gula. George, just a reminder, you are muted. Um, George grew up both in Philadelphia and Scranton, developing his trolley interests at a young age in Philadelphia. After graduating from Penn State with a degree in business logistics, he spent his entire career working in the transit business, first in Scranton and then in Pittsburgh, where he worked from 1975 until his retirement in 2008. 
He joined the museum in 1975 and currently serves as an operator and a conductor. He also volunteers in the archives and he gives uh, outreach programs to the local historical society, senior groups, and other people who reach out to us. A lot of people specifically ask for George. So we're really, really grateful uh, wow. that he does this. So <laughs> he's been writing for uh, Trolley Fair, our member newsletter, since 1977. All right. And at the end of this, we will have a question and answer session with George, but the chat box will be open throughout. So please feel free to enter questions or comments during the show, and we can read through those at the end. And this program now is being recorded. Um, it's asking me that I'm speaking German. I'm not speaking German as far as I know. So I'm going to put it in English here. I'm not sure if you guys got that notification, but this will be shared on YouTube, hopefully in English. Uh, in just a few weeks. So please keep your microphones muted. I'll ask everybody to turn their videos off now during the presentation so we can minimize distractions. I'll invite you to turn those on at the end and we'll let everybody unmute themselves at the end as well. All right, George, if you are ready, take it away. Well, I am ready. Just got to go through all of this and get it started. Uh, wonderful. Great. Great. Well, hi, everybody. And uh, yes, I'm very glad to be back. A little bit about the show before I started. It it really began because the Rochester Historical Society uh, asked Kristen if somebody can do uh, a program on the Beaver Valley Traction. And I started that in 2022 um, and gave it in February of last year um, because I was doing historical research up in Beaver. Uh, that historical society asked me to do this, and that was done last October. And uh, now I'm I'm up here doing it with you. There are credits, of course. I've got two pages of credits. Uh, C.J. Uh, Bick, one of our younger members, was uh, just added about an hour ago. Um, a lot of books to, and a lot of newspapers uh, were used. And uh, remember that I gave this to people who know a lot less about streetcars than uh, most of you guys. And so I began with this map of the uh, Pennsylvania streetcar system in 1918. And as you can see, we had an awful lot of uh, uh, rail operation, electric rail operation. And then we focused in uh, for Southwestern Pennsylvania. And, and some of the folks did not know we had this many uh, rail lines, electric rail lines operating uh, from the, uh, Beaver County uh, Genealogical and Historical Society, you know, we kind of focused in a little bit more for the Beaver system. And you can see the Pittsburgh system coming up from the uh, bottom right, and there's a big gap. There's going to be a discussion about that. And uh, some of other pictures are going to substitute for the horse car. Uh, I have never found a Beaver Valley horse car shot. Uh, so we'll use Citizens Passenger Railway. It was operating. Uh, in 1884, when a group of businessmen from Beaver Falls, um, they discussed trying to get around. I mean, how to grow their community. And certainly transportation was an issue. Uh, so let's go down to Pittsburgh. And I'm sure they took the train and examined the horse car line. And this is Pittsburgh's first, uh, which opened in 1859, the Citizens Passenger Railway, which ran up uh, Butler and Penn. Uh, they liked what they saw. And they organized a company uh, in September of 1884. It was the Beaver Valley Street Railway. Uh, they got their charter about five days later for a three-mile uh, horse car operation. And it was from the Beaver Falls Bridge uh, over, over to New Brighton. They used standard gauge, which was common here in western Pennsylvania, began their construction in the beginning of May in 1885. Uh, kind of a beautiful view of the Beaver Valley here. Uh, the streetcars began running on Independence Day in 1885. Uh, they ran from New Brighton's uh, Railroad Depot. And back then it was the Pittsburgh, Fort Wayne and Chicago. Nobody ever heard of the Pennsylvania Railroad west of Pittsburgh. Um, the depot was up on uh, Fifth Avenue, across the river and uh, went up Seventh Avenue in the stables. The stables were at the bottom of the hill at Seventh Avenue. And here's the... Uh, covered bridge that existed at that time and uh, they said the cars the newspaper clipping i found said they were crowded all over the cars they were hanging off the cars uh when they derailed at this crossing 
everybody just got off, and I imagine the cars were light enough, they just put them back on. Here's a Wilkesburg car, and uh, needed to show people uh, another view of a horse car, and again, they didn't exist. Uh, normally, they had one horse, except there was a grade um, on 7th Avenue, and they would get a second horse out at that point and hitch it on, uh, pull the car up, and then they would walk the horse uh, back down. This is a Wilkesburg car uh, sitting in. This is an actual plastic token uh that was issued by the street railway company we had the first two paying passengers paying a whopping five cents aw glenn and frederick s mitchell we have the name of the conductors john b barrett was the conductor uh robert morrison the driver and they collected a whopping 55 dollars uh that day which i'm sure in today's money is a bit more than it seems that number seems 1891 Shows up about six years after the line opened. They had nine cars and 52 horses and a three and a half mile line was in operation. They considered it very successful. But of course, at the same time or literally the same within a year of the horse car operation, uh, the streetcar line in my hometown opened up in Scranton um, and that proved very successful. And even though it has a troller, uh, there is evidence that uh, Vanderpool, who set up this system, quickly came up with the idea of a pole two years before uh, Frank's break. This is a, a four-wheel car. Pittsburgh, uh, of course, the, the big city in the area in 1890 in March, uh, began their operation. Uh, that was the Second Avenue Passenger Railway Company. Uh, they would extend out to McKeesport and Homestead, East Pittsburgh, um, and Braddock. So on East End Line. Uh, and so in the spring of 1891, another group of locals met um, and they organized what was known as the Beaver Valley Traction Company. They were going to electrify the horse car line and they were going to expand the system. And of course, they they chartered uh, another system, the Central Electric Street Railway in uh, June 29th, 1891. And that was the way most Pennsylvania systems raise capital. They would charter a line and then eventually lease it. And here's an open car. And there is the, uh, uh, on the left, the clipping for the opening of the line. Uh, this is uh, the PNLE station in Beaver. And uh, it's a postcard on 3rd, uh, East 3rd Street, right at East End Avenue. And then, as I said, the Beaver Valley Traction would absorb that central electric through contract and they would buy the stock uh and then they purchased the horse car line uh they electrified it they double tracked it uh and they went across the sharon bridge uh from new brighton to beaver and then over through bridgewater uh and to third street at buffalo street and that's pretty much if you go through beaver uh today that's about where the cemetery begins if you come up uh the street from the river uh, supposedly it opened on October 1st, 1891, but, uh, for some reason, the electric cars really did run until December 5th. And I have never been able to figure out why. So, uh, I know that's probably a question, but, uh, from the official opening date, they weren't running cars for a while. They had 18 of those cars in a route of seven, uh, miles. Um, this is actually from a, a map that we have in our archives, and I was able to cut it up into pieces. Here's the system, uh, December 5th, 1891. And it goes from uh, 8th Avenue and 27th Street in Beaver Falls, right up about here. I hope you can see my cursor um, over 17th, uh, down 7th Avenue. They cross the, uh, uh, the Beaver River. And then over in 3rd Avenue, um, right about in here, okay? This is another system coming up. Um, the cars, of course, were down on 3rd Avenue. The, the railroad station, the old railroad station, would be up here um, on 5th. So they didn't serve that railroad station. Here's a picture of the bridge. This is a typical car that was used. Note that it says U.S. Mail. Uh, and this is one of the original 10 cars. They were 16 feet long. Uh, this bridge was a toll bridge. And they did have a contract to carry U.S. mail and pouches uh, through the communities. They also 
carried newspapers. And believe it or not, they wound up having a mail car. Uh, just as elaborate as some of the ones that ran here in Pittsburgh. They had some onboard workers that did some sorting um, as the cars passed through the various towns. And uh, they made this from a former 10 bench car. It was typically white uh, with gold lettering, and that was the postal colors in most cities. Uh, but this mail service was discontinued early. It went in 1907 at the Shot and Junction Park. Um, and typically you get pictures here when uh, we'll talk about the park later uh, when the Beaver River floods. But it does show uh, some of the earliest types of cars, the uh, four wheel cars. Um, and again, the public really doesn't know what these things are. So it was a good, good, good shot. And of course, you got to see the line car, too. And up in this picture, they've moved them out of the way um, because the car house, which is back here on the right, I'm sure is just as flooded as the park. This is a postcard um, that actually was in color. And believe it or not, it actually had the correct colors of the cars. They were dark maroon uh, with some gold lettering on them, very much like uh, the early Pittsburgh cars. This is East Third Street in Beaver. And I've gone up and down this street trying to find these buildings. And, and there's been a lot of change on East Third Street. Some of them, you really can't place some of this. Uh, another car with the U.S. Mail. It's an open car. They had eight of them. Uh, and the public, of course, like so many cities, love these open cars. They love the open air, particularly on a hot day. And, of course, the conductor had an impossible time trying to collect the fare in a car that had no aisle. And... Uh, you know, of course, just like every other city, these were dangerous people hopped on, hopped off whenever. Didn't matter if the car was moving uh, and they were an accident hazard and they would disappear early. Um, we're on Third Avenue in New Brighton. It shows an open car rattling along and that building still exists. And uh, all of both buildings, actually, the one in the back uh, and the nice dome building, I think, on the right. And that's number 825. So we know where that is. Here's the hill um, on 7th Avenue at 8th Street, the one that caused the uh, horse cars so much trouble. Whoppingly crowded street, not an automobile in sight. Uh, there's a wagon parade here because they're honoring the 100th anniversary of Beaver County. It was brick paving. There's another shot of the hill taken from a bit farther um, east. Um, it's between 5th and 6th Streets on 7th Avenue. Now, you really don't find too many records. People ask me what the fair was. And uh, a lot of newspapers, particularly the Beaver County newspapers, have not made it, if they survive, to newspaper.com. Um, you grab snippets like this. This was 1893 when the fair was five cents, typically uh, a fair of that time. Beaver Falls to New Brighton, that was the fair. It was 10 cents from Beaver Falls to Beaver or Bridgewater. Um, and the traction company in this uh, article wanted to charge a nickel for every parcel, bundle, package, or, or briefcase you were carried in. And they wanted 10 cents when they were, it were carrying them between Beaver Falls and either Beaver or Bridgewater. And I'm sure that did not go over very well. And I'm sure that did not happen. Now, you've got a second railway being chartered up there. Uh, and that is chartered in 1891 in August. That's the People's Electric Street Railway Company. H.P. Brown was the president, and they proposed building a railway from Crow's Run. It would be around the north end of Conway Yard, uh, New Swickley Township, up through St. Clair Borough, Freedom, uh, Rochester, which back then was called Bowlesville, uh, and then continuing through Rochester Township. And they wanted to go um, to the Bridgewater end of the Big Beaver Bridge. But they finally built it to start in St. Clair Borough, and they went north as far as what would become Junction Park. It was known as the Junction uh, because the track ended, and then a few feet later, the Beaver Valley Traction Company rails began. And they had come, they were coming across the Sharon Bridge, making a turn and going north. They began in May to construction and uh, unlike today where things last for years 
They were testing their first car on August 11th, 1892. This is in Rochester, this picture with the celebration and, and it's either a national holiday uh, with all the American flags up or it's possibly uh, the beginning of regular service, a big celebration. There's two cars here. Uh, the People's Electric had four, four wheel cars. And uh, as you can see by the massive crowd and, and there was a place for speeches to be made, uh, certainly something big was happening. Um, the People's Electric line is, is shown here. And uh, the junction in Brighton Street, this is Rochester in here. Here's Junction Park. And then there's 3rd Avenue down to Freedom. Now, when a Central Electric opened their line into Bridgewater and Beaver, we don't know. Here's a newspaper clipping uh, that talks about it. Uh, they have to uh, strengthen the bridge that's spanning the Beaver River. Uh, this is this is a, a we hope uh, to do this by mid-October uh, newspaper clipping. And I'm not sure whether it was. I, I can't find the evidence of this in the existing papers on newspapers. Um, they extend, uh, as you can see, through Conway's Corners, what would become Conway's Corners, across the Beaver River. And uh, through Bridge Bridgewater, which is over here, uh, into Beaver. And that's October 1891. This is Freedom. This is the southern end of the line. It's the main street of Freedom. And I want to take a good look at it because none of that exists today. It is a four-lane Route 65. Uh, this would become the main highway between Pittsburgh and Cleveland. And, of course, you can see the problems that would present the end of the line here. Uh, was the southern end of Freedom at the border at 8th Street. Another open car uh, running on Freedom. This is 3rd Avenue. Beautiful card. Yeah. yeah, here we go. My finger was too fast. Now, the, route, the line followed the Philadelphia, Fort Wayne, and, or it should be the Pittsburgh, Fort Wayne, and Chicago. I'll fix it later. It's a multi-track line, even back then. Um, and they had some dangerous crossings. You can imagine, <laughs> it, was a, it, was, it was a busy railroad. Uh, in this drawing, the southbound uh, car was going to cross the railroad. You can see a conductor on the other side. That's because it, it crossed at this location at two right angles. And there were derails at each of these locations. And the derails were set to actually derail the car. The car had to stop. The conductor had to actually walk across the track. And after manually setting the derail, he would have to stand out there and flag the car across. Okay, There was no other way to get across. Uh, the car would derail. Now, we're, we're kind of running down along the people's route uh, between Rochester and Freedom. Rochester was known as Bullsville. Uh, back then in Junction Park. And and notice you don't find too many people living down here, nor are there any major industries on this side of the river. So that's going to affect uh, your revenue. And, it, and the car line is on the street uh, in front of the house where the wagon is. There's another shot of the car line. <clears throat> Much better view. In fact, there's a streetcar uh, behind some of the poles in the middle between the house and the railroad, and, and as you can see, it was a nasty dirt street. So they hadn't gotten it out of the mud yet. Uh, another shot, this is along Water Street. So when you came out of Rochester, you would go uh, under the Pennsylvania Railroad. And uh, I don't even know if you can get to this location today because there's a major highway here. It's very rudimentary paving at this point. Um, I think you can reach this street, but it's a very roundabout way because uh, again route 65 has cut right through all this but there's the car barn and the powerhouse for the people's electric street railway and this is uh, is from what i've been able to find out half of the um fleet two cars or half of the fleet that they had and there is um you can see the car barn right down in here. This was the carbine above that bridge. This is the Monaca Bridge. 
and there was big brewery there. Um, now, they came out of Rochester to get to Water Street via New York Avenue, Railroad Avenue and New York Avenue. Uh, back in the 80s, there was still some track uh, located down here. Very hard to find now. Uh, these are southbound cars, and this is the Pensy. Um, they're going to turn uh, from New York Avenue uh, onto Railroad Street. And the highway runs completely through here today, but about where they're turning, you can still see one or two of the buildings. This is Rochester. Um, you're running along Brighton Avenue now. You've turned off New York Avenue. And, and this really hasn't changed. Uh, the buildings are all still here. Piney Street is still here. And you can really tell uh, exactly where this was. Then you go through what would become Conway Corners and you'll go into Bridgewater. And I'm not sure that I could see very much of this today. Again, it's it's all been changed with road work. Uh, Rochester is up in the background in this hill. And we're heading through Bridgewater uh, a small community, and then we'll get into Beaver. This this picture shows up in many, many uh, publications, and uh, that is Junction Park, which would become a company park in the background. Uh, the building over to the left is part of the shop area. It's an office building for the car house. Um, and, and again, you know all this, but hey, a lot of our the people that view this show do not know how a car changed. We show this at the museum sometimes. We pull a pole down and flip the seats. Well, this is the end of the line here. And, of course, you see coming from behind the office building and making a turn, uh, this is the Beaver Valley traction here. And this, lo this location, when all the lines merge uh, and, our, and the track is connected, will become just known as the junction. The Sharon Bridge is off uh, to my left. And they had gotten rid of the open cars by 1920. Now, 1892, and another system is chartered, and that's the Riverview Electric Street Railway. It's chartered by a land company, the Riverview Land Company. They want to develop a section of Riverview, which is really off to my, off down to the bottom and up on a hill. And uh, then they're going to run it over um, another bridge that's there and head into New Brighton, and they will actually be up there near the railroad station um, when they build this line. It's a single track line. They have two passing sidings. They have to do this weird switchback uh, when they come from uh, this area here where the Pensy station was on the bottom, and uh, they had a manual signal system at the two sidings that they had, and they went through this 8th Street Hollow. I'm still trying to find it, uh, one of the historians at the uh, Beaver Genealogical Society says he knows where it is. Um, but they ran up through here, um, up, up a hillside, a very steep hillside, and they went up to reach what was known as Riverview Park. They had a uh, an athletic field up there, and uh, they played games. There was basketball up there, and there was also baseball. That didn't last very long. They were trying to develop the area on top of the hill near the park, and that area was never, ever developed. They had some very tight curves, steep grades, and, and if you you know take a look at this newspaper clipping, it's going to tell you that the last trolley to leave the park at 12.15, and I don't have a date, I'm sorry, uh, it was crowded. It was probably an open car. And it rolled down and left the tracks and then careened down the side of the hill. Well, the bottom of the hill is the Pennsylvania Railroad, and it's a very steep hill. Um, it turned over, and then it hit two large trees. Uh, that halted the car. Otherwise, he would have gone down another 150 feet or so um, onto the railroad tracks. Then they're going to cross 7th Avenue. They're going to cross this bridge, the 10th Street Bridge, which is no longer there. Uh, and they they chartered a bridge company to build this. Uh, the charter was May 1889. And uh, that's New Brighton. That's the, the hillier section of New Brighton uh, beyond, okay, 14th Street. 
It's possible that could have been a real Riverview Electric Street railway car in this picture from a postcard. Another postcard looking the other way. Um, and you can see the dam, which is still there. And all of the industry, uh, which well, populated uh, Beaver Falls. It was a very busy area. Glass plants, I know, were there. Uh, ironworks uh, were there. So you can see it all on the river. Another nice postcard of a car there. And uh, again, is it a real Riverview car or is it part of the Beaver uh, Valley car? It opened in 1890. And uh, I'm not sure. I think the piers may still be there. And, and almost all the pictures of this operation are here. I've never found a postcard or a photo in New Brighton. Uh, on this section, on this Riverview um, extension here. This is a Riverview car. You can see it's already part of Beaver Valley. Um, this is the main intersection out here in uh, on 7th Avenue. And that's the line it would run until about 1924. It's crossing the main line of Beaver Valley Traction. Now, another line chartered north from Beaver Falls this time. The College in Grandview Electric Street Railway that's chartered in July, early July 1893. And they want to build about a mile and a third up to the college, to the College Hill area. Um, and there was a college up there then. And they're going to go up, uh, you know, up from the end of the tracks at 8th Avenue and 27th. And uh, for those that are looking at Google Maps, they're going via College Avenue, 32nd Street and 4th Avenue to the Wallace Run Ravine. That's Moreto, and there'll be a park established at Moreto, and they open the line on July 31st, 1893, with two cars. Well, Beaver Valley Traction purchases the line in August 19th, 1896. Uh, they get controlling stock of this Grandview Electric Street Railway Company, and what they're doing here is trying to prevent another line from using it as part of its construction. They double track it. This is about 28th Street along College Avenue. You won't see this area. It has been the road has been totally uh, changed in terms of its direction, and the college expanded a bit. Uh, but obviously, in this picture, uh, the sweeper has come by. Now, there's this weird thing out there on the bottom called the Patterson Heights Incline, and it serves Patterson Heights. It runs from 1897 to 1927 using one car. It's only a 10-passenger car. It's only 10 feet long. <laughs> Not much bigger than a 4x8 model railroad. Uh, that car was built in 1895 along with the Incline. And what it does, you know, it... it, it it's going to go down to the PNLE depot. Uh, and originally the depot was here. They'll move that depot down later on uh, to about the middle of the picture. But right now the depot was there. And uh, this is from the country club that you're no longer allowed to take uh, uh, train pictures from. But they'll run that car uh, a small way um, from the foot of Bridge Street at 7th Avenue. Um, and it's very short ride kind of up over this street to the incline. There's the incline. You can see the car on the bottom. The pole is going to stay up. They're going to hook the incline up. It's a single track going up to the top of the incline. Off on, a on the top, but over to the right, maybe going down about halfway, um, is the counterbalance car. The pole stays up as you go up the incline. From the incline to the railroad station, it was like any other streetcar line. Had a pretty good grade, 20%. And this is about 1908 here. That's postcard postmark. So we know it exists. Here's a map um, I dug up. And uh, you can see the incline heading up. There's Ross Hill Road, uh, which you can still drive up. And there's the counterbalance over here. And the car starts its climb, and you can see it's a very big car. There's the uh, counterbalance track over on the uh, left. Um, they didn't need much, much power from the car motors. Um, 
to take the car up the hill because of the counterbalance. No, excuse me. And the dummy acted as a brake if you were going the other way. There were two 50, power, 50 horsepower motors on this car. And uh, you had, the, like I said, the overhead trolley up. It, it, the car trolley moved up this gable with the trolley on. Um, and that would run until 1927. Here's the Beaver and Vanport Electric Street Railway. That was another company chartered in February of 1897. And they wanted to move the line now from Buffalo Street up past the cemetery uh, to what was known as Sassafras Alley. Um, that was the Beaver Vanport border. And if anybody gets off the interstate up there, the Beaver exit drives down a bit and stops at the Brighton hot dog shop. Um, that's where you will be. That's where the end of the line will be. Um, you'll see in here that um, there's dual gauge track because uh, and Beaver Valley Traction, of course, in, and in the Beaver system here is all uh, regular broad gauge. Okay. Beaver Valley Traction gets an agreement with the Beaver in Vanport. Yes, we can use your tracks. We'll run the cars up uh, there. So why are these why is this track uh, dual gauge? We'll find out in a bit. There's a branch over to Monaca, built over the Monaca Bridge, and then the new Monaca Bridge will show up later, and that will also have track. And uh, the Monaca, the Rochester and Monaca was another system chartered September 1900, and... Uh, they get permission to build a railway from the southern end of the bridge in Monaca op up and over to the 9th Street, Pennsylvania Avenue to 21st Street. So pretty much through Monaca. And I believe Pennsylvania Avenue is the main uh, street in Monaca. And then the cars will come and meet the mainline Beaver Valley Traction cars. So on the left in this postcard is a car that's come from the Monaca Bridge. He's served Monaca. He's coming down. He'll transfer his passengers to uh, mainline Beaver Valley Traction cars. And uh, if you stand here today, I'm standing on Route 65. Uh, but the building over to the right is still there. So I was able to clearly identify this location. And then from that location, coming up that hill, and the bridge is just off to my right, track will curve, and head out to the Monaco Bridge. So that's what it'll look like in its Pleasant Street. You know, this was the, you know, um, New York Avenue was down on the bottom. And the car would run up here and, and over the bridge. There's a shot of uh, the Rochester Monaco Bridge with the car on it. To give you an idea, that's a double truck uh, deck roof car. And over here in the back is uh, p and &E Bridge. And you can see the junction of Pennsylvania Railroad lines, uh, one line heading south along the Ohio River under the p and &E Bridge, and the other one heading off uh, towards Beaver, Beaver Falls in that direction, the junction, basically. Here's a car, a postcard shot of a car in Monaca on Pennsylvania Avenue. This is 9th Street. So he's come about nine or 10 blocks already from its uh, terminal and it's getting ready soon to run across the Monaco Bridge. He's about a block away from the Monaco Bridge. Okay, now the Beaver Valley Traction Company um, is gonna have to acquire some lines. It gets the College of Grandview operation um, and connects its lines, okay? Uh, double tracks the line beyond Geneva College to Moreto Park. That happens in 1901. Uh, and in October of 1900, Beaver Valley Traction uh, consolidates almost everything else. All the underlying railways uh, get consolidated under the title of the Beaver Valley Traction Company. And you can see what they include, the Beaver Valley Street Railway, the Central Electric uh, Street Railway, the Beaver and Vanport Electric Street Railway, the Rochester and Monaca, and the College in Grandview. Okay. Um, and in December of 1900, it gets a hold of the People's Electric Street Railway, purchases their stock uh, for about $1.2 million. Um, that allows the Beaver Valley Traction Company to gain access through 
New Brighton and Rochester to freedom. So now it's become one big system. Uh, from Moreto off here to the left, it's going to go through College Hill, Beaver Falls. Um, it has two ways to go through one through Bridgewater to Beaver. Uh, here's the shuttle line, uh, the 10th, 10th Street Bridge and the shuttle line in New Brighton, the Riverview line. Um, and it's going to head over into Rochester and over into Freedom. Third Avenue, right about to the border in Freedom. Here's the shuttle uh, to Manaka. And here's that Beaver and Vanport line uh, up into the border at Vanport. So it's become a fairly big uh, system. About 17 miles, actually, worth of electric railway system. It's not done expanding. Um, now, the Beaver Valley Traction at the same time had been bought by Philadelphia investors. And they decided to spend quite a bit of money, 200000 or so dollars for improvements and track extensions. Okay. The, the system really needed an upgrade. Um, it was in many ways, you know, it had fragile maintenance, uh, even though there was still a profit. All they say is Philadelphia business, but here's a good example of the type of ties that were used, the type of track um, that was used. It was 46 pound girder rail. Uh, or light T-rail. And of course, this is typical of so many uh, lines that were put in very quickly. And uh, this is 19.3. The car was was kind of light. The wire wasn't uh, bad. The pole is kind of bent, as you can see. Antiquated fleet. Um, this is one of the original cars uh, from the system, the Rochester system, you know, and we think it's New York Avenue and Brighton Avenue, um, but we're not sure. That was speculation. So they bought these, these K40 to 45 were showed up from Brill and uh, big deck roof cars, about 40 feet, 45 feet long. It's a builder's photo. It's typical of uh, cars that were built for other systems. And uh, they bought more. 192 46 to 50 cars 46 to 50 showed up and they would replace the uh the uh, little single truckers that were kind of falling apart this is over at the junction park car house this is the maintenance crew out there during world war one about 1917 um they think during the winter definitely <laughs> during the winter but maybe february and it has fenders and it has couplers and it's all the accoutrements of a streetcar from that era. Um, this is Moreto Park. The traction company opened that up in 1891 uh, near the Wallace Run Ravine. And it was a typical trolley park um, picnic ground, though, primarily no rides, even though uh, the, they said there was a carousel later on on the ground. But it was some place that you could go, you know, dress up and go and enjoy a picnic and enjoy the fresh air. Um, and get away from your hot apartment, particularly in the summer, uh, and from all the industrial smoke caused by the use of bituminous coal. Um, in 1900, Traction Company needs a new barn. And down here on the bottom, it purchased 25 acres of land uh, from a local family, the Marquis family, $25,000. That's where the junction is. That's where the Sharon Bridge is crossing the river, um, and this is where they're going to connect the Beaver Valley Traction and People's Electric Railway tracks because they both converged here. And the barn, they were going to build the park, uh, that yellow plot right up above the Sharon Bridge area and the little barn uh, right below. And here is uh, some views of Junction Park. You know, we're looking south. That uh, smokestack is from the powerhouse of the Beaver Valley Traction Company. And you can see that powerhouse. And if you go a little bit toward the right end of the picture, you'll see streetcars just hanging out of the car barn. They had a carousel that they built for $10,000. They built a roller coaster there uh, for another four or 5000 more. They had a dance pavilion, swings, a restaurant, lots of greenery here. Um, and I love the way they say clear, sparkling water. Um, 
but I guess you can imagine what most folks tend to drink or had to drink back in those days. There's the a, a the gate. They, there's the roller coaster in the back and a number of the buildings here. Uh, we're looking from the railroad. You can see the switch in the street. That switch is heading over to the Sharon Bridge. Um, the straight track is going south towards Rochester, 25 miles from Pittsburgh. So even a Pittsburgh paper, the Pittsburgh Press, thought this was an ideal picnic ground. Groups ought to go if they want to leave the city. They ought to try it, take trains, you know, take trolleys, although you couldn't get all the way there by trolley. And uh, there were special fares. You know, they also touted Moreto Park as a nice place to go. Uh, Junction Park, of course, was next to the Beaver River. Uh, that can be a problem, as you can see. And they had a number of floods here. Uh, this is the 1913 flood. They had a big one in 03 and another one in 07, uh, and probably several more. The big 1936 flood, which affected Pittsburgh and so many other places, caused the park to close. Um, the dance pavilion was bought uh, by a local in 1938, a William DeMoss, and he renamed that dance pavilion the Greystone Gardens, and they continued to dance uh, with big bands right through the Second World War, um, but it burned down in 1945. It's another picture of the junction. You can see the competition uh, that will show up over on the right, the automobile. And uh, there was a racetrack in the rear. You can see the racetrack here. And there's a double track, now double track uh, line, trolley line on the street. And if I look the other way, um, what I'm going to see in the background is the Beaver Valley Traction Powerhouse. This building is a carhouse office. Here's this monstrous carhouse. Uh, you can see that partly behind the uh, dance pavilion and the carousel. Uh, that's a great shot. I found that hanging up on a wall in the Rochester uh, Historic Society. And it didn't do a bad, I didn't do a bad job, you know, considering that couldn't take it out of the frame. There's the Sharon Bridge in the back. And uh, there are cars stored, the huge car house. The small building to the left of the car house was actually the shop. Uh, up front, uh, number five was an office. Four was the powerhouse. They're nicely numbered. This was a paint shop, number three. Uh, I'm not sure what number two is. We'll find out in a minute. There was an operator's uh, an operator's room here. I say we'll find out because I got a map here. Um, <laughs> pardon me. The uh, crew crew had to walk a long way uh, to get to their cars, uh, but they did have a crew room way over here. Uh, there's the they had a shop here, carpenter shop. Um, there's the office we talked about and then the powerhouse with they had a coal pocket there. They could get uh, coal cars delivered uh, by rail. There's the car house also suffered uh, flooding um, as well. And they would move a lot of these cars out when they knew it was going to flood. Uh, they took all the cars out. There's a postcard I dug up. Um, I never thought I'd find who it existed. Never thought I'd see it. But uh you can see some of the buildings, the car shops, the office uh, that we just talked about. And then in the later days, uh, at the end of service in 37, you get a good shot of this cavernous building that was the car house and buses all over it by now. You notice the storage tracks have been disconnected off to the right um, and just a little bit more distant. And you can barely see, but there are some cars still in this uh, bat cave. Almost the end of service when this picture was taken. We're going to head down a little bit, 1903, October, and they want to extend southward. Then they establish the Freedom and Conway Electric Street Railway. Um, they want to go all the way down to Conway, and now you can see the Pennsylvania Railroad um, off to the right. And this is Freedom. Again, all of these buildings are going to be demolished to make way for a four lane highway. It's East Third Street is the name of the street. And this is, was the end of the line, 9th Street, um, and that's Penzi over there. Um, they're going to extend south from here. It's what's known, uh, you're looking west uh, toward Freedom. This is Crow's Run. It's north of Conway. The shelter um, is a waiting shelter for Conway Railroad, Pennsylvania Railroad employees. 
um, and what few residents seem to be out here. There's no development here at all. The Crow's Run is still there, so you can sort of see, you know, you can sort of see the location based on that. Um, the Freedom of Conway, 1903. The Beaver and Vanport uh, Electric Street Railway. The Riverview Electric, uh, Electric Street Railway. They're all going to be merged now into the Beaver Valley Traction. And this system extends from Moreto uh, in the north all the way down to Conway, to Crow's Run. That pretty much shows it with the branches to Monaca and Vanport. Um, now, 1904. Baden and Conway Street Railway is organized because they want to go south. They want to go farther. 3.5 mile long line is going to be built to Baden. And in this case, it wasn't bought by the Beaver Valley Traction after it was built. They just leased it and they operated it. So now they have some lease track as well as their own track. This is what it looks like. 1924. You can see the Penzi signals, the Pennsylvania Railroad signals over on the right. And uh, as some of the roads were rebuilt, don't forget, it's still the main highway to Cleveland. Uh, but at least they have built a track along the side of the road and improved the highway here. It's a very narrow highway. 1924 again. Now, same postcard uh, that you saw before with the maroon car, but I didn't have anything else to use to mentioned that 58 cars ran on this system uh 32 miles of track so we're still going to go back to east third street in beaver but it's a black and white photo this time so i guess you can say it's a bit different on july 24th 1905 uh pittsburgh railways secured control of all the charter rights and franchises of this 35 mile long beaver valley traction company you know and they purchased all the stock um, and all of its interest from the Philadelphia based owners that had originally invested in it. Now that's the Philadelphia company and they issue $6 million in stock um, and in September. And a lot of that is designed to take over the Beaver Valley company and then to uh, install a lot of elaborate improvements, or at least the paper said the elaborate improvements. Philadelphia Company was, you know, one of many utilities uh, owned by this man. It was George Westinghouse um, in the, he had his mansion in the East End and in 1884, discovered natural gas and uh, had to find a way to pump it, make, make money. Um, and he found this Morbin charter uh, in the state in Harrisburg called the Philadelphia Company. And from there, it becomes a huge utility company, oil, gas, mining. Uh, electric generating interests, which was, was a big thing up and coming back then, and both Pittsburgh Railways and the Beaver Valley Traction. Here's a car on 3rd Avenue in New Brighton. It's advertising Junction Park as a great place, and I put this one in. It's a nice shot, certainly, but it does show for the general public uh, the use of the fender. Uh, one of the very early primitive ways to try to protect people who had fallen in front of a car from being being ground up by the wheels and all too often occurrence. This is 1907. The system runs from Moreto Park to Baden. It includes 35.6 miles of own track, the 3.5 least miles of track. Um, and there's first and second track, 21 miles of first, 14 of second, which I'm assuming are, are sightings and carhouse track. It now has 41 passenger cars, including still 14 opens, um, one express car, three uh, work cars of various types and two sweepers. And uh, here's a little bit of a ride. I tend to do that. Shows you the car at the station in Moreto in 1904. Somebody looked at this picture at the Beaver Valley Historical Society and, and when I dragged it out and said, hey, the guy in the right's my grandfather. So these are the 600 series cars. Uh, and so, you know, pictures taken uh, of this line tend to exist um, in the 30s, in the late 30s, uh, as the line was, was heading toward its demise. Uh, it's a mix when you run down towards Beaver Falls from Moreto. It's a mix of residences at that point and a lot of open land. This is 4th Avenue at 38th Street. We're in College Hill. 
And uh, these two cars, these cars were purchased in two groups, 1923 and 1927. Again, on 4th Avenue, uh, looking southeast toward 36th Street. And the pavement is really, they have paving responsibilities, and that paving is really getting bad, as you can see. This picture, this postcard used in so many publications, I've never seen where it was, except we know it's on 7th Avenue. Something is going on because other 7th Avenue pictures do not show all of this activity with tents and vendors along the side. You know, it, you try to find this location and, and so many of the buildings just don't exist. We haven't been able yet to identify this location, but there are the double truck cars that we saw purchased early in the uh, turn of the century. And here's another shot. I mean, the massive amount of business here uh, it was incredible. If you can find a library in this picture, you can kind of identify it. But again, so many buildings have disappeared, have changed. Uh, I wonder how many people hit that with their automobiles. Now, the colors are not correct. These cars should be marooned. And typically all of the watercoloring done over time. And sometimes these postcards were produced and colored several times. Um, that's inaccurate. Other shot on 7th Avenue. But just gives you the a magnitude of the business um, that was going on up here. It's a very prosperous town. There was uh, one of the cars built, I think, in 1927. This is seen in 1936, of course, one year from before abandonment. And uh, the, car's, the car is falling apart. The, the, a document I found you know, indicates the maintenance got very bad in the end. Um, United States Senator Quay, who was very powerful, the United States Senator, and was very interested in, in the trade aspects of pennsylvania pennsylvania he wanted to see pennsylvania make money he got involved somehow with the uh, uh philadelphia system and uh I, he 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 might have been the one that allowed so many other charters uh to be put uh in place in philadelphia and, and would create a system where the wideners had to buy uh you know buy up those charters and create philadelphia rapid transit uh, but he was from Beaver County and he died uh, like so many people will. And, uh, you know, they put black bunting on the cars during the funeral. Cars had to run very slowly. They were not allowed uh, to ring any gongs, make any noise whatsoever. He was a widely respected man in Beaver County. Uh, I was able to find the location of this place, even though some of the buildings are gone. Because there's the grade, and of course that doesn't disappear. And the open car is climbing the hill. It looks to me like somebody is stealing a ride on their bicycle. Take a look at it. Um, then we're going to get to the location of the railroad. This is the second railroad bridge here. The original railroad bridge uh, was up a bit over on the left. And uh, you can see a streetcar, one of the 600s down here. A little dark, but it's climbing up. Uh, the, the ramp uh, just I believe down below on the left uh, somewhere would be the final uh, Harmony freight and passenger station and now we're in New Brighton um, and it was not that easy to find out where this was but somebody remembered that church they said it burned <laughs> and so did the building to the left of it in fact the number of churches seemed to, to burn here and uh, that was the third. He said that was the United Presbyterian Church. The main street was Third Avenue in New Brighton. And if I'm looking now down third, I'm looking towards Rochester. Um, and a few buildings are still here. And that steeple on the left, there is still a church there, the First Presbyterian Church. Uh, the church on the right burned down, but you can eat a great hot dog at the Brighton Hot Dog Shop. That was right in that location. Now, this is accurate. Um, this is, uh, and you might recognize 
we had an open car picture before their buildings over on the left uh, showed up there and that's a yellow car right painted maroon like all the pittsburgh cars were um in that period and because buildings are there we know it's on third avenue between 9th and 10th street these cars were purchased in 1917 and uh they would would go back to Pittsburgh in 1923. You can still see where this is too. Route one, it was Route One, Lead Steel Car. And it's seen on Brighton Avenue. It's just turned from West Madison Street. Uh, you're at the north end of Rochester. Nice view of the uh bumper. This view is unchanged except people don't dress like that and nobody drives a horse down the street anymore but you can tell where everything is in this picture we're heading down the hill toward new york avenue that's piney street uh over on the left and then it'll turn down onto new york avenue we'll be heading to the railroad that's all the heights of rochester in the back um then we're going to cross the railroad and we're going to head along the railroad. And here uh, they're actually um, repaving. Uh, this is called Freedom Stretch. And that was just the name of the road for, between Rochester and Freedom. Uh, the word stretch. It's a stretch of road. And it looks like they're doing some paving here along the Pennsylvania Railroad. Now, this is Beaver. It's a southbound car on 3rd Street and Insurance Street. Um, cars coming from Vanport. Okay. And again, a nice open car. That's my shot of Beaver. They were all gone. These opens by about 1920. Let's go down below Conway. American Bridge comes to Ambridge. So they organize. They realize the town's going to get big and they need transportation. Um, they need connections to other places, and they organize two streetcar companies, two separate companies. The French Point, I don't know where to get these names, but the French Point Electric Street Railway, that was designed to connect Ambridge going north to Baden via Dust Avenue. What was Dust Avenue at that time? Uh, there would be another uh, line to operate the local service, I think called the Eco Bridge Line. We think this is the first day um of service it's 400 block of merchant street uh in 1906 the eco bridge street railway would operate local service along merchant street in ambridge and that's the only postcard i've ever found of ambridge with tracks okay it's august 18th 1907 and they will complete that car line from Baden to ambridge and the first passenger car will run that day and uh, there were two underlying companies building that. Uh, they were paper companies. Uh, by, uh, in, and they were owned by the Pittsburgh and Beaver Street Railway, which had been organized by real estate developers. And these two paper companies were the Ambridge and Baden Street Railway and the Ambridge, Leedsdale and Edgeworth Street Railway. And if you look at the names, you know where they want to go. They want to go head down to Edgeworth and Sewickley. And then they would contract with Beaver Valley Traction upon completion to operate the line. The Beaver in Pittsburgh, or the Pittsburgh and Beaver, rather, would still remain as an independent company. Uh, this is the boundary between Leedsdale and Edgeworth. And this line was opened as far as here on September 7th, 1907. The loop was off to the left. And at one time, I remember seeing the track. Uh, going into it. Now, Edgeworth and Swickley did not want to see streetcars there. The only reason the track loop is in Edgeworth is because the owner of that property had a Leedsdale post office uh, address. They brought down the officials to take a look at everything, and they, they treated them royally at Junction Park. Uh, but we get into what was known, and I'm still trying to find out more about the famed tro so Wickley Trolley Wars. And they began in 1905. Uh, 1905, Harrisburg granted seven railway charters for various lines in the area. And this did not sit well with all the upper crust folks living in Sewickley. Um, 
they thought the usual uh, the roads would be damaged their properties would be damaged you know who was really benefiting well those real estate developers in ambridge now what you don't realize is swickley also had a working class group most of them living down by the railroad and they wanted the streetcar because this would provide uh, better opportunities for them to go get jobs better jobs than what you could find in swickley of course, it was more expensive to ride the trains to other jobs outside the area than it would have been for a streetcar. Here's, you know, this card says it all about Sewickley, Sewickley, quiet, residential, you know, a reputation, he said, for leisure, uh, a place for the affluent, no noise, no grime. And, you know, you have to realize, too, a lot of Pennsylvania Railroad people who ran these passenger trains up and down the line to Pittsburgh, um, they lived there, too. And they certainly wanted that lifestyle uh, and that business to continue. Here's the Swickley Railroad Station. And, uh, you know, it was a railroad town. It was known as a railroad town. All the wealthier residents traveled to Pittsburgh or other places by train. It was sophisticated in, in a way, you know. And uh, I saw this clipping and I wish Ed Leibarger had showed it to me once years ago. And, and right now the newspapers are not um, accessible in our archive, but uh, he showed me a clipping. And, and this really said it all because people were worried about, you know, bad people coming to Swickley. And the clipping said that that if streetcars came to Swickley, ruffians would come. And that word was used and it was put in quotes. And I've used it here. I wish I could find that clipping. Now, there was some uh, valid argument about trolleys in Sewickley. Beaver Street was the main street. It wasn't that wide. And somebody drew the picture of two trolleys and then the, the carts that would normally be there. And they said, hey, you put a double track line. It's going to be terrible. My guess is it would have been like so much of the railway system out there, a single track line. And uh, <clears throat> Pennsylvania Railroad fought this. This was 1907. Um, they, they actually added as, as the talk of trolleys coming to Swickley occurred, they actually, and then the talk of trolleys coming up from Pittsburgh, um, again, the Swickley gap that never was closed by a railway line, the railroad, the Pennsylvania railroad actually added a number of extra passenger trains and they boosted the service. In 1895, there's not even a threat of streetcars, and, and they were opposed to the whole idea. You know, now in 1903, it becomes a real threat. They're actually running. And uh, so in 1904, there was a lot of fighting, a lot of uh, discussion in the council and public meetings, and the, uh, the franchise was denied. And the paper calls this the Great Trolley Battle. And they just said no trolleys will be allowed to build in Sewickley. Again, Penzi's fighting it here. Extra trains. That might have been a, an extra an extra slide. Now, the pro and trolley forces will continue at it for a number of years. Here's the person that says all that opposition is based on fake news and false information. Somebody else writes a poem. And that's his his sentiments against the trolley. You know, the trolley can't come. Um, how he likes the green streets and the stillness and the lawns. And he doesn't want to hear gongs. He doesn't want to hear noise um, and clatter. So scaring horses. Here's the big meeting of May 15th, 1912. And, uh, you know, uh, I love it. E.P. Coffin, the cashier of the bank, declared, well, the time has arrived. We need to connect with the other towns. And the majority uh, voted to allow a trolley line with restrictions. Uh, the residents demand it. If they get a franchise, the company got a franchise. If the ordinance for that was passed, um, you have to, they wanted a re, an annual remuneration from the streetcar company, pay us for the use of your valuable streets. Uh, Pittsburgh Railways, they didn't have any definite plans, so the franchise ordinance was never acted upon, and the gap was never closed. And of course, by the 1920s, all the mania of, of, of streetcar lines connecting everywhere was gone. The automobile had shown up, and the only 
streetcar to ever come to Sewickley would cross the Sewickley Bridge from the Coriopolis side. Uh, that bridge had been opened by Allegheny County uh, in September of 1911. And so reluctantly, uh, the borough said, well, you can get your streetcars across the bridge. And there's the bridge railings on the right. You're going to turn right there. You're not going up to our business district. That's a good three or four block walk. And this, until 1952, was the only trolley service that Sewickley would ever see. After that, it was replaced by buses. Ohio Valley Scenic Road, just to let you know, there were some other systems there. And uh, if you, you take a look at the uh, down from Steubenville, you know, heading up the Sliver Pool to Wellsville, and finally connecting into Beaver, uh, there was a number of small systems, I think two of them, uh, which began opening in Ohio. Um, and finally, by 1900, to become one system. And they built north along the Ohio River to the state line. Um, and then they connected with yet another underlie of the Ohio River Passenger Railway Company. And they were incorporated to construct a standard gauge line uh, down to Sassafras Alley, Vanport, <clears throat> in Beaver. Here's a postcard which clearly shows one of their big yellow cars. And they an agreement uh, between Beaver Valley Traction and the Steubenville East Liverpool and Beaver Valley um, came about. And they allowed a second track. Of course, they had to get borough permission. But there was now a second, the dual system, a third rail was laid. And they were able to go all the way down you know, 3rd Avenue to East End Avenue in the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Railroad Station. Um, they actually sold combination tickets and scheduled their cars so that you could board a Pittsburgh and Lake Erie train and get down to Pittsburgh. And this became a very convenient way for a long time for residents to move from Ohio into Pittsburgh. Um, the early track, of course, <laughs> not quite as good as the paved picture I found later. But uh, this is around Sassafras Alley, and you can see the dual gauge, and you can see not very much uh, is up there right now. That's one of the cars. And like, as I said, they sold 10 ride tickets, p and &E tickets, and uh, um, they competed essentially with the Pennsylvania Railroad for the trade to Pittsburgh. And they had schedules uh, that actually showed both the interurban connections and the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie train connections. So here we are up around Insurance Street. There's the station, which is still there, East End Avenue. So you could clearly get up there. And that's a PLE bridge over the Ohio in the background. You can clearly go up there today and see where this was. They pulled into a single track, you know, changed ends and would begin leaving on, on their schedule. Another system that came into um, Beaver Falls was the Harmony Line. The Pittsburgh Harmony Butler in Newcastle left the, and built a branch from Millwood City. Um, they got there about 1914, January 1, 1914, I believe. Although I have 1915, uh, Mr. Franchak corrected me on that. And uh, they went through Koppel and, you know, from Millwood City. Um, and then they crossed the Wallace Run Ravine on a very big trestle. Um, and the Beaver Valley Traction pilot crew took the car from Moreto uh, down to the lower end of Beaver Falls. They, they unloaded on the street. A freight and passenger station uh, there were down on Fifth Street. And, and contrary to the myth that only the gunboat cars operated there, uh, Bill Franchak, who is a master historian on the uh, Harmony Line said that older operators had told him, no, they took they took the bigger standard cars like the one we have at our museum. They fit under that bridge. So that's a myth that only the gunboat cars would fit under that bridge. Looking all the world like a yellow car. They got 12 of these and they were acquired from St. Louis, just like so many of our other Pittsburgh cars. They were ordered. They were identical to the Pittsburgh railway cars. Here's the interior um, of them, and they were copies of the Pittsburgh 4300 series cars. And uh, this is on Third Avenue, one of the few shots I've seen of a, a car of this type actually in service, 1918. Uh, it's outbound to Vanport. 
Now, these cars in 1923 would be sold to Pittsburgh. And they Beaver Valley Traction, which desperately needed the money, um, would would actually get more money than they had cost, uh, more money back than they had cost. And, uh, you know, after they left um, and since they they were supposed to have come up on their own power via the Harmony line. Uh, after they left, it's it's assumed they came back the same way or went back the same way. Uh, these are one man. They were they were they were costly to operate. They were certainly not one man cars. Uh, the up and down topography of the area uh, didn't lend itself uh, to having a comfortable ride with these big cars. So, you know, after the sale, the company makes the statement that they were just not suitable for the system, but. They had been purchased at a good price and were probably told, hey, you're going to get these cars. What did show up then were these Bernie cars. And they actually would get about 20 of them um, over time, the first coming in 1920 and the next group coming in 1921. And, of course, these are one-man cars, far easier to operate, probably uh, more in keeping with the type of, of – uh, ridership that they may have in some of the they were they were i was told they were given a rough ride if you read uh statements by some people they would bounce back and forth from end to end as they said uh but they were used all over um a lot of um a lot of these would run till about 1925 some would stay uh for a bit longer and um it's been said that they actually were seen a lot of times on the vanforth to edgeworth run which makes me believe, and I haven't found scheduling yet to verify this, that they might not have cars that went all the way through from Edgeworth and Ambridge all the way up to Moreto. That makes a lot of sense, that maybe the junction was a place where everybody transferred. Um, the car is now in bright orange. It's 1923. They get the Beaver logo, as you can see by the door. Um, and that same year, they're going to be replaced by uh, double truck cars, the 600 series. Um, these cars here, galloping cigar boxes. That's what the Bernies were known as. 1921, Pittsburgh Railways combined two paper companies. As we said before, the Ambridge and Baden Street Railway and the Ambridge, Leeds, Dale, and Edgeworth. Uh, now they're all combined into Pittsburgh and Beaver. And there's a charter issued to build and operate a 9.8 mile line from Baden to Edgeworth and then to Sewickley and then uh, to connect with Pittsburgh Railway. So that's going on again. Um, here's 601. This is one of the new cars, great side view. And uh, these would be replacements for the Bernies. Uh, the last group of these cars, the last five or so, seven, would show up in 1927. And they lived a rough life. If you take a look at the side of that car, it was pretty scratched and pretty banged up. And as time went on, maintenance would become uh, shoddier and shoddier. This is Junction Park Car House. There's that office building that I told you about. Uh, it They received the orange paint scheme as well. 30 feet over the corner post, and they also had the beaver applied to them, okay? Now, there's a, this is, I just put the whole thing down because it was interesting. Came out of the Electric Railway Journal, April 9th, 1921, and it's describing the system. A trunk line straying along for 19 miles through the Beaver and Ohio Valleys, the largest towns on its lines, only 12 blocks wide, the smaller communities only four to seven blocks wide. Then they mentioned the backcountry beyond those towns had little tributary population. So the riding characteristics on this system were dependent on the location of the factories and homes in the district. And then they said there were parallel railroads and, and the railroads were charging uh, 0.82 cents a mile, which of course you can't uh, survive on for in, in, in trolley company days. So, so the electric railway journal is already saying, well, you know, the ridership, uh, is dependent on a very small uh, population and it's not increasing. And this is showing up uh, beautiful automobile family, probably getting ready for a Sunday drive uh, note. I guess you, you took a ride in a car on Sunday. You dressed up as well. 
but this was cutting into the short um, and long haul business. And that shot was 1922. The other problem with all of these automobiles moving is that these tiny roads, this is freedom. They all look like this <coughs> are being clogged. You know, this is the main highway, as I said before, to Cleveland. And everybody's using these roads for local uh, driving as well. So now it's going to start affecting the car lines environment. And the finances are bad. You know, what system? I've never heard of a trolley system that, you know, had employees lend money to it for several months. But they did. Uh, the employees and, and operators, and they agreed to lend a company $10,000 each from their semi-monthly pay. And they did this for four months. That was in March 1921. Uh, this is the last year of all streetcar operation. It's 1923. And they carried 13 million streetcar passengers and 511,000 transfer passengers. Um, 1928, they eliminated the transfers, but the ridership doesn't look too bad. It's still fairly steady, 10.7 million. Uh, actually up a bit from the 1927, right? Um, in 28, buses have shown up. They're going to carry 1.3 million riders, total of 15% of system ridership. And a lot of these changes are going to happen the following year, 1924. Um, the 1924, the traction company gets the ownership of the Baden and Conway. They don't have to lease it anymore. Their actual track miles are going to be 36.2 miles. Um, and they're still operating over almost 15 miles of the Beaver, the Pittsburgh and Beaver. They have 42 cars, uh, including 32 one-man cars. They have still quite a few work cars yet, eight of those and two buses. And up on top is the, you know, again, another pretty scratched, beat-up car at Junction Park. Uh, on the bottom... Um, down here in Freedom, uh, why they're storing cars there, I don't know, but they're parked there. Uh, some good news in 1924, the company got the Rice Safety Award. They had 233% decrease in accidents. There had been no fatal accidents, no disability uh, resulting from accidents that occurred. So this was awarded by the Western Pennsylvania Safety Council. And they made a big deal out of it. They painted a car up uh, uh, touting this and touting safety. And that's Junction Park. George, quick question from the chat. Do you know how much they paid to end the lease? I don't. I don't. You know, you know, Kristen, the problem with this probably is that um, a lot of the records of Beaver Valley Traction, when they came back to Pittsburgh, and the company really wasn't operating streetcars anymore, I suspect were dumped. And very little paper survives from Beaver Valley Traction. So I, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. Well, I guess that's more research to do. Huh? <laughs> well, they, they had a Beaver Valley Motor Coach uh, subsidiary incorporated. So many bus companies, you know, started up as subsidiaries of the railway company. That was February 29th of 1924. And they were going to operate two feeder bus routes, two. One was between Leedsdale and Sewickley. So they're finally going to get down into Sewickley um, with a bus. And that begins July 16th, 1924. And you have a 20 minute rush hour service, 30 minute off peak service and that fare is 10 cents there's a picture of the first bus and here are a bunch of buses sitting around the junction uh park car barns behind my back for those looking at this the other bus you know they're going to replace that three mile long riverview car line it's losing money buses will show up on september 1 1924 and that relieves the company of paving obligations which apparently were $125,000. And they're going to run a 15-minute headway at rush hour. Three buses. Two buses will run the off-peak service. And that fare is a, is a dime, as opposed to the cash fare, which was a streetcar fare of five cents. And uh, But their reduced rate tickets also sold at seven for 50. 
uh, since. Well, there's the beaver. We all wonder where the beaver is going to show up. And it shows up kind of late in the system's life, uh, 1924. It was a new logo. And uh, it was considered the industrious beaver. There he is uh, chewing through wood, a log. And it was it was used to characterize the service. It was put on everywhere. And it was used on ads in department store windows. Wherever the public attention could be attracted, it was there. It was in newspapers. Um, I wish I could find one of these. This hat was introduced in 1924. And the gentleman, I, I, I've, I've got a, I've got all these controls blocking his name, and I'm sorry, but he was one of the original horse car drivers. He would become one of the first motormen for the electric cars, and he's in his full uniform, as you can see, with the typical railway hat. Well, in 1924, they got rid of those hats. This was a decision of the operators and conductors, and they they got these comfortable caps with the beaver on it and they were lightweight and, you know, they said it fit better and didn't cause headaches and protected the eyes better from the glare. And the brim looks pretty good when you compare it to the hat on the uh, left. There they are. Here's the whole gang all up there uh, dressed up with their ties and their uniforms and their new caps. Men loved these caps there is the beaver being used uh, in one of the many uh, pharmacies or drugstores at the time. And, you know, they introduced a weekly pass and a Sunday pass in 1924. So some of these uh, places sold them. And they also painted up on the cars advertising. Um, so this is the first time exterior advertising shows up. There's another one. Of course, they're all saying, ride the trolley. And, and look, you know, our local steel and glass plants manufacture stuff used by our trolley line. So, you know, you buy, you know, when you buy, we buy the supplies, you're kept at work. So ride the trolleys. These showed up on the cars, a little sign placard, uh, placards. Uh, or a frame, and you could put, as you see on the left, uh, uh, ads uh, for events. And this one on the left was the leap year dance uh, over at Junction Park. Now, what was neat was if you didn't have anything to put in there, you pull the ad out. If you look on the right, the electric railway transportation is economical. Well, they they painted they painted fixed um, ads if you want to use the term, on that. So there was always something there. It was a, never a bare uh, metal uh, area. There's uh, car cards. This came out of the Electric Railway Journal in the uh, PTM library, but it clearly shows uh, uh, some of the ads that they put in to their cars. And then they had these drawings of streetcars instead of the windows, you know, They'll, they're telling you now. This car seats 40 passengers. 20 automobiles transport the same number. You know, so get on our streetcar, you know. Um, these showed up in the newspapers. Uh, the Sunday pass was introduced and weekly passes because ridership at this point was declining. And uh, they were, th this advertising, you know, was totally thrown in all of the papers an all zone pass sold for two dollars, two zone pass sold for dollar sixty, a one zone pass at eighty five cents. The Sunday pass only costs twenty five cents. So they really pushed <clears throat> the idea of the pass, trying to get people back. Um, this one, I don't know if it would go very well nowadays when everybody's getting offended. Uh, but these operators would come out in, of the barn and they didn't really have that much change on a Sunday and everybody was putting in their $5, sometimes $10, certainly $1 bills. And then <clears throat> they would get change and uh, allegedly put the change in the collection box. And this is saying, put your fives and tens in a collection box, give us your dimes and nickels. And, you know, I thought I laughed at that when I first saw it. Um, they had every so often crossword puzzles and if you uh, in the paper and if you got the crossword puzzle right, you won. 
you know, an all zone pass or, you know, a, a weekly pass, though this was from 1925 uh, from one of the local papers up there. So, you know, first prize was 10 bucks. Second prize was an all zone weekly pass. Third prize, a two zone weekly pass. Here's their Beaver Valley Traction Company sleigh. 1924 um they they began around 1911 or 12 to hold uh big christmas events at the park at junction park and they would go on from the evening you know through the night and santa of course would show up in the sled you can see the beaver valley traction company logo on it and apparently they ran from what the paper says uh extra cars and they went to children's orphanages um, homes for aged women. They they got all these people to the party and they got them all back. Uh, this is a valley area. This is, the, you're along a river, you're in a valley, high winds, you know, the constant uh, floods and it's a recipe for disaster and disasters did strike. Number of floods struck um, and this was the 1907 flood and this really shows the immensity, immensity of that uh, car bar. And there uh, behind the car barn is the Sharon Bridge. And uh, everything is, is quite flooded here. Um, it was a, it was an event to go take a look at. And pe people came out uh, to see this is the Beaver. This is the bridge, uh, Bid Bridgewater Beaver Bridge, and whose deck would later burn. And there's a streetcar off to the left behind some of the uh, uh, metalwork. And so they're running a shuttle line as far as they could. Uh, they sometimes got caught, as you can see. This is Bridgewater. People canoeing on the water. And then when it was over, the expense of cleaning it up, uh, five and a half feet of mud were in this location, which I think is near Junction Park. And all of this had to be cleaned up. So you're paying the cost of the cleanup. You're also losing a lot of revenue while this is going on. And of course, winds would fly through the valley. This was a tornado uh, that brought down trees um, in 1926. And here's a shot, a rare shot of one of the Bernies actually out there in service uh, while they're cleaning things up. I, I get a lot of shows where people want to know, do these cars ever derailed? And not only do they derail, but sometimes they give you a one, you know, a one stop ride right to where you want to go. This was over in, uh, the Taylor Lunchroom at Conway's Corners, not too far from the bridge between Bridgewater and, and Beaver. And uh, he apparently left the tracks. And, uh, but these things would happen. They would hit automobiles. They would hit trucks. Uh, parades would slow things down. Um, and this was uh, stuck in a parade on 3rd Avenue at 10th in New Brighton. No idea what was going on. Uh, the 20s will bring on very hard times. We've seen some of them. Uh, the paving uh, obligations are starting to hurt. And uh, in Ambridge, they they uh, they decided, nope, we're not going to get it. We're not going to be here anymore. They they took their lead still so quickly bus to Ambridge. That was temporary for a little while in 1925 in April. But then by the fall, they made it permanent. Uh, this is a postcard of a car on Merchant Street. They're going to start to retrench. In 1925, the system carried 12 million riders, streetcar riders, almost 900,000 bus riders. And when they eliminated the transfers, it was pretty good. They, it stayed at 10.7. Not bad. Um, but still, you know, this is the 1936 flood. 1926, the company developed this novel idea. This was a public relations thing. And a local uh, artist, Lewis Hake, painted the car different on all four sides. And I wish I had a better picture of it. Never found a real picture of it. This comes out of the Electric Railway Journal. Um, it's the spirit of the local industries here. And they did this for the Industrial Art Car Series that celebrated the Beaver Valley. And I was surprised that it was the fourth leading county in Pennsylvania in production tonnage, um, including, of course, the mills. Uh, the images reflected all the industries and the various communities 
uh, that they served. And here's the end, which is a much better picture. The eyes of the nation are on Beaver Valley. Look at the way they put the, you know, the eyes within the United States. <laughs> now, it gets better. And, and we won't be able to read it all. I'm sorry. Um, but I put it in there. Uh, they sent this car to an advertising convention in Cleveland to show the progressiveness of the valley. And, and Beaver County manufacturers paid for this move. Now, if you look at, at that, it says that it, it traveled over five different electric railway lines. And that means a standard gauge car had to go all the way to Cleveland. And, and so not being familiar with that, I still have a hard time believing that they did that, that it actually ran under its own power. You know, it's just that the middle, uh, the, the middle clipping says that it, it passed over five different electric railway lines. Now, maybe the freight, maybe it, it ran on, on the, the connecting uh, trolley lines via flat car. That's possible. Um, they, they had a beauty contest as well. And uh, four, four of the 200 contestants were, crowned Miss Beaver Valley. So they went with the car to represent the region. They passed out uh, brochures and other paperwork. And uh, that gave all the information and advantages that you might have uh, if you located your business in the Beaver Valley. And then here's a shot that we have in our archives that actually shows it running. It's really in service. Not sure where, but it's in service. Patterson Incline. Goes away, you know, by 1926, the ridership had declined so much, fares went up to a dime, from six cents to a dime, and uh, the traffic patterns began to shift. And because the Pennsylvania Railroad, I don't have a picture of this work, had taken their, uh, that had built a new bridge, and the new bridge was not where the old one was. Um, and the PNLE station was then moved to a new location to get out of the bridge's way. Um, and that meant that the, you couldn't get down, you know, from the Patterson Incline to the PNLE. Of course, there was a lot of automobiles out there at this point, and it seemed like it was not convenient, and it closed in 1927. Okay, it's July of 1927. The Beaver, the Pittsburgh and Beaver, now placed in the hands of the Traction Company. Uh, they carry a million five hundred thousand passengers that year. The expenses are so great, though, that they lose eleven eleven million dollars, eleven million six hundred ninety three dollars. So, this is the bridge between Bridgewater and Beaver. And as I said before, I think the flood in nineteen thirty one ruined the bridge deck. Um, when we opened that that uh, bridge deck later. It had no tracks. It was 1933. Uh, several cars had been trapped on the Beaver side. They ran a curtailed shuttle for a while. And that service went away in 1933. And in fact, they announced at that point that all the regular trolley service between Beaver, Bridgewater, and Rochester was officially gone. Uh, at that point also, uh, because, of course, the Steuben Village, Liverpool, and Beaver Valley had run on third, they had to truncate their service. Uh, back to their original line at Vanport. So now they weren't coming into Beaver. And here's one of the uh, yellow cars in Maroon uh, in 1920 or thereabouts. And these cars, as I said, came down, came up from Pittsburgh on their own power. They probably came down back to Pittsburgh on their own power. Um, 1927, uh, here's the... Uh, Harmony Freight Station, they they had to move their station in order to get out of the way of the new bridge. Um, and 1931 would see the last of the Harmony service uh, going up through Moreto and up to Elwood City. That line would be truncated back. In the meantime, in 1935, these were the uh, Steubenville cars, and they stopped running to Vanport. They only went to Midland. And here's the end of the line at Midland, and that service would end. November 27th, 1938. Uh, kind of an interesting. Here's W.F. Bong, the general manager of the traction company. He talks to the Ambridge Council. And this is 1930, July of 1930. And he said the uh, 
You know, the present plans of the Philadelphia company are approved. If they're approved, streetcars will be replaced by either buses or trolley buses, because at that point, Pittsburgh was seriously considering the use of trolley buses. He thought in the next five years, the traction company would have to spend about $600,000 to improve their facilities, their track, and uh, it's a lot cheaper to run buses. And in fact, here we are in 1933, the Public Service Commission announcing the substitution of buses for streetcars between Ambridge and Rochester. Okay, because the finances are deteriorating, you know, nothing is going to run below Rochester, uh, below Junction Park, uh, and that would include to Freedom. Um, 1931, the company stops paying their bonds. They go into receivership. Um, and it's the Depression now, and all the heavy industry that had been discussed in that Electric Railway Journal article, you know, uh, it hits. The, the Depression will hit that. It hits the ridership and uh, the plummets to point point five million dollars, both bus and rail. Uh, they can't earn enough money to pay their operating expenses. And they have three hundred thousand dollars <throat> at that point in paving applications. Excuse me. Here's July 7th, 1933. That's when it enters receivership and WF Baum is appointed as the receiver. This is Rochester, uh, the main street in Rochester, Brighton Avenue. It's in horrible shape, as you can see. Track looks like it hasn't been replaced for quite a few years. And uh, the paving alone is pretty bad. You know, automobile traffic as it increases, the bus traffic as it increases, is going to really help to beat that surface up. They work with some communities. This is up in College Hill. And College Hill lets them spread slag between the rails and put oil over it. So the old gravel and oil thing. Um, this part of the road I don't think exists. They've relocated it. Uh, but it gives you a good idea. There's Freedom. Uh, freedom <laughs> told their lawyers, their solicitor, you know, to either, either get the company to make repairs or stop the trolleys. And then they... Council decided we're going to oust you guys on May 12th of 1930. And then they must have re reneged because the officials in the company entered into an agreement and the trolleys were operated until repaving began. And uh, June 17th, 1930, uh, the trolley company asked for permission to run trackless trolleys. They were refused. So in March 14th of 34, the last trolleys operate on 3rd Avenue in Freedom. Hits Rochester two months earlier in May of 1933. Uh, Rochester trying to get the, they tried to get the company to pave and the pay, company couldn't. So one day the trolley comes up and finds up iron stakes, you know, stuck between the tracks and fire engines and police cars blocking the tracks. You know, and this goes on for a day or so until a judge issues an order, uh, an injunction to keep the cars running. Uh, this is midnight, Sunday, September 22nd, 1935. All the trolleys running south of Junction Park Car House are discontinued. That's going to include the shuttle between Rochester and Monaca. And they put replacement bus service from Sewickley to Junction Park. 28 coaches do this. It's, it starts September 33rd. It's a Monday of 1935. And that means over half the system is now operated by buses. Here's the Bernie cars uh, stored along the side. That that the uh, uh, announcement of the of demise of the streetcar service means any remaining Bernie cars uh, are gone. This is 1932. Some were already in storage. And the end of the service will be provided by the 600 cars, the newest cars uh, that were there. This is 4th Avenue, looking towards 37th Street in College Hill. Um, maintenance was bad. Cars really looked bad, you know, and, and the public just has no sympathy for the traction company and its need for money. They don't care. They're driving cars. 
Get your track out of here. Here's the Cavernous Car House, August 8th, 1937. It's two days before the abandonment. And there's the charter. Probably one of the few charters operated. And then on the 10th of August, 1937, that's the final day of street cars in the Valley. 611 is the final car. It leaves the barn it's around 450. Everybody's got torpedoes and, and their pennies are on the track. And, and a lot of people are out there to watch it. You know, here's the photo of everybody in front of the car. It's almost a gala celebration, okay? Um, John A. Elliott, Beaver Falls resident, was the only surviving member of the original board that incorporated the electric traction line. He was on the car. And Fred Noss was a boy, about six years old. And he had ridden the first horse car on July 4th, 1885. He was also on the car. And then and some other companies have had this happen. The return trip and Silvener Hunters literally dismantle the car. Somebody takes the operator's seat. You know, it had been it by the time it, it came to the barn, it had hardly anything in it. It wasn't nails down. Light globes, seats, bells, you know, everything, everything was gone. Some of the car bodies, the Bernies were all scrapped, of course. The Bodies of 600 to 613 went to the Third Avenue Railway Company. Uh, they were hoping to, trucks, of course, didn't go. They were they were broad gauge. And the New York system found out that the cars were so badly rotted, they just left them in the car barn. Um, they were still there in 1940, according to Luther B. Cummins. Some two or three cars were hauled up to a um, uh, B Brady's Run Park. Uh, at least two were converted into a summer cabin. One became a tool shed. Uh, a young teenager, Nathan uh, Gonauer, um, 19, uh, he tried to get a car preserved, you know, but they were so far gone that, that it was impossible. I have no idea if any of this is still there. Uh, the bondholders, well, they're going to get messed up, you know. They agree to accept 20 cents on the dollar for their bonds, their first mortgage bonds. Two cents on a dollar for any junior securities. You know, the, the remaining 50 shares of Beaver Valley Motor Coach are acquired by Baum in 1941, and the traction company is now liquidated. And buses are running, and the buses will do a fine job during the Second World War. Uh, but after the conflict, you know, not much is going to happen. They're going to just keep running. Um, and then uh, it's going to show a profit the last profit in 1965. And of course, things are changing again. The highways are coming up, you know, the malls are showing up. I mean, again, conditions are changing and uh, the service is going to cut back, be cut back literally to nothing. And and until finally, only the run from Beaver Falls to So Wickley um, is going to remain. There's some new buses up here. And and that run is is discontinued in January 31st, 1972. There's a lot of acrimony up there, a wildcat strike, a lockout. And uh, at the same time, roughly the same time, you know, Port Authority had had offered a yearly operating subsidy, you know, to that bus company. You know, they 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 had to, you know, they were not allowed. Port Authority was not allowed to compete with the private systems unless offering to buy them out. And so they were offering a subsidy. Now, I remember this. I was working there in, in Port Authority um, when their transit company was formed in May of 1980. And they had no drivers, no facilities, no buses. So uh, for about four years from 1979 to 83, uh, they contracted with the Port Authority to provide the bus service. And those buses would come out of Ross Garage and the first trips they ran on Monday, January 17th, 1979. That was the 18G. Um, later, there would be one or two shuttles, 25s, uh, 25 C and D. They would operate on the heights um, up around that area, but uh, around Aliquippa. And the rates and service department, of course, was at that point known as rates and service, was the, you know going to develop the timetables. Now, there are three of us from the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum there, me, Art Ellis, and uh, Ollie Miller. The library is named for Ollie Miller. 
And we put this schedule together. And Art comes from his house with that, look at that logo on the bottom, the beaver. We had the negative made and it was attached to the timetable. And Art said, I still remember this to this day. I wonder if anyone will remember. So the beaver's running once more. And actually, never stopped. Uh, here are the two sweepers that Beaver Valley Traction owned. Near Junction Park, they're sunning themselves. And uh, uh, number one came up as part of an order for seven sweepers. 1918, six of them stayed on Pittsburgh Railways. This one went up to Beaver County. And eventually, as you would imagine, they only needed one. All those track miles were gone. And Pittsburgh reclaimed it in 1935. Um, and it became part of about a 40-sweeper fleet uh, that ran around. It became M56, um, running for both Pittsburgh Railways and the Port Authority. In uh, May of 72, guess who bought it? Yep, we did, the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum. We have restored this. It's beautiful. Uh, not only is it beautiful, um, and the beaver is on the car, uh, but it's an operating car. And apparently this happened. I wasn't here for this too bad. This happened uh, when it was snowing earlier this month, early February. And I think I was told C.J. Bick, one of our younger members, took this. Not only is it sweeping, but if you look at the pole, he got the picture perfectly when um, the pole arced. So it's an operating sweeper, and it will always be there, and the beaver will still be continuing the ride to rails today. And that's all I have. And I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you, George. That was awesome. Um, let's see. I did write down a question. Uh, one of them I, I uh, posed in the middle there about the um, paying to end the lease. But uh, oh, I don't see my gallery. Where are you guys? Oh, hold on. Let me share what's coming up here. I'll take over the screen share there. Okay. Um but uh, feel free to turn your videos on now. Um, George, we did get a question about what you meant by the gunboat cars um, uh, with the Harmony route. What, what well, those the gunboat cars um, had a very low roof. Um, they didn't they didn't have uh, oh, what I'm trying to do. Clear story roof. Is that what I'm looking for? You know, the passenger car roof it was a very rounded low roof. And they had bought those cars probably in the mid 20s. And uh, or by the mid twenties, they were there, and everybody just—it's—it's it's a term in the industry, not not even the real industry. It's a fan term. Um, you want me to turn that back on? If you want me to, uh, I can go show it to you if you want. Yeah, sure. If you want to go find that, let's let's, um, yeah, let's see how this works. Yeah. In the meantime, I'll let people know uh, if anybody is local. We've got a new operator, um, new operator training this weekend. Um, yeah, you're probably going to have to go back pretty far. I'm going to go back. <laughs> I'm going to go back. Um, well, while you're doing that, um, and then March <laughs> and 10th, we also have tour guide training. So this is for uh, new folks or our current operators who are kind of interested in, um, telling other people about history. Uh, so it, we kind of will let you know how to do that and, and some, uh, visitor experience tips and all that. I think you're almost there, maybe. I, well, you know. <laughs> the only other thing is to shut it down, move it up, and then replay it. And and uh, I don't know what's, what's more annoying. I'll just keep talking. Um, yeah, keep talking, Chris. So uh, a month from today, we're actually going to have a trolleyology on uh, Toronto from a gentleman who works um, – in urban planning up there. So it'll be Toronto Streetcars past, present, and future. Should be pretty interesting. Um, I believe he has authored a publication or two. And um, so that'll be interesting. And then um, looking for presenters because the next one I'll have scheduled is in June, which should be really interesting. It's gonna be called uh, Rails to Victory, Allied Rail Operations in Europe after D-Day um, oh. from a gentleman in the Netherlands named Hans Altena. Are you there, George? Let's see. Almost, almost. Well, we're 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 almost yeah, done with the ride. This Somehow, is a, I may have missed it. Yeah, I think you missed it because we're like. I don't, I'll tell you what. I don't. Why don't I do it this way? Because I want to put this back on. Why don't I? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, 
I, I want to entertain you as much as I could. Sure. Day, you know? Uh, so you. let's see. Um, and then again, if you missed the beginning of the show, we do have the um, West Penn Trolley Meet and Hoosier Traction Meet coming up June 7th and 8th with a special trip on the light rail at PRT on June 9th. Um, oh, sorry, Toronto, Canada. Mm. Yes, that's <laughs> what someone said in the chat. Uh, lots of nice comments com coming in, George, um, of folks who didn't know too much about Beaver Valley Traction. So this was a great, uh, well-researched program. So uh -huh. Robert, uh -huh. ah, there we go. <laughs> there, okay. Uh, notice the contour of the roof of that car, okay? It's not only kind of a long a long car, but but it's it's that low, and I'm not a railroad buff, but you know, I don't think that's the clear story one, but it's that low arch roof. Arch, I think, is the way I need to put it. And uh the fans call them gunboats. I don't believe the company called them gunboat gunboats, although Bill Franchek is the man to ask about that. Oh yeah. And and again, the rumor was well, they bought these because they were low cars and and they wouldn't fit under that bridge otherwise. But okay. the older, but the older cars fit under the bridge, and Bill Franchek had found that out. And you know, he is the encyclopedia on the Harmony Line. Excellent. Um, and then I have set it so that folks can unmute themselves if anyone has um, a question that they'd like to sh ask or a comment that they'd like to share. Um, Catherine Black asks, "What is SEL and BV?" Oh, uh, Steubenville, East Liverpool, and Beaver Valley. That right. was the name of the company that came out of Steubenville, you know, and, and served Ohio. Let's see. Oh, why am I not moving here? <laughs> there. There. The Ohio Valley Scenic Route. So here's uh, Beaver Valley, right, and then East Liverpool. You know, they built this grouping of lines from Steubenville into Beaver Valley. And there was a lot of mania going on back then. We got to connect everything with everything. And and they looked at connecting Pittsburgh through Sewickley. Mm -hmm. that they could have a direct connection into Pittsburgh. Um, and so that, that was the name of the line. Steubenville, East Liverpool, and Beaver Valley Traction. Any questions uh, for George? Uh, yes, I have one, uh, Kristen, and it was the one we, we discussed in an email. George, if the line through Sewickley had been completed, and I would assume at that point they would have merged uh, Beaver Valley into uh, Pittsburgh Railways because of the common uh, corporate ownership, how do you think the service would have operated? Would the, the, there have been an interurban type service out of Pittsburgh to up into the Beaver Valley or would it just been the local train, the local cars is operating and just to have an interchange at some point. It's, inter it's interesting speculation, you know, absolutely. It's speculation. See, I can certainly see Pittsburgh railways trying to get into Swickley. Um, You know, they're looking at bringing people down, you know, how far else, how far would they go? I mean, it's a good question. They'd have to go at least as far as Junction Park and Rochester. And and I don't think the company, Beaver Valley was not operating through service from Moreto, you know, all the way down into Ambridge. Uh, you had to make connections to Junction Park. Uh, you know, operating a long line like that, that, that lends itself to all sorts of delays um, if one thing goes wrong on the line. But that's that that's total speculation. I think at least as far as so quickly, and and maybe that's the point. Then that everybody changes changes at in so quickly. Yeah, I could. I A could local see trade, that. in other words, in the Beaver Valley comes to so quickly, and then you transfer and you start heading down on Pittsburgh Railways, which would have been in so quickly. That's I mean it's pure speculation but but based on what i had done that's what probably would happen that's where the connections would be yeah i i thank you george it just seems like you know if they had made the connection and with the uh, common corporate ownership 
it just seems that they would have operated them as, uh, you know, some sort of coordinated operation. Well, they were already operating. I don't know what, what kind of operation they would do schedule-wise. Corporate-wise, they were already running the two separate systems. Right. And even if they made a connection, you know, you're you're up here on the corporate level. Um, and, you know, what, what would they do? What would be best on the operating level? Yeah, I was basically talking about on the operating level. Yeah, on the operating level. My guess is both 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 railways would meet in Sewickley and I think there would be some place, some way to turn around and uh, whether that would involve a loop down the road, I don't know, but you know, uh, had Sewickley been, been, you know, uh, had Sewickley allowed the streetcars amenable to streetcars, I, I have a feeling because, because the business district is where everybody from the North and the South would want to go to. That's the destination. So I Thank think you George. make a connection in Sewickley. Anyway, that that's my my personal opinion. George, excellent uh, excellent uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have other questions for George? I think it was very thorough today. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Uh, well, I know this this helped me learn a lot about uh, the system that our sweeper came from. So. Um, yeah, I still haven't see, gotten to see it, see it run in person, although we've had plenty of snow this year. Well, for me, I'm from the South. It, it always seems like a lot of snow to me, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I'll get to see that run in person someday. But, uh, if there's no other questions or comments, Ray Janosko, do you have yourself unmuted? Do you want to uh, say I don't think I do. Oh, well, you do. I, I just wanted to make sure you didn't have a question. <laughs> no, we're good. I just wanted to, I just posted in there about that. They graded the line to Dixmont State Hospital, but I don't know if they ever actually laid track and actually ran service up to Dixmont. No, it always ended been, at, at uh, Emsworth. That's what I kind of thought, yeah. because you could see the grade until they actually destroyed it when they wanted to build the Walmart on Ohio River Boulevard. But uh, like I said, I never found any proof that anything ever ran beyond Emsworth, but that might have been the idea they may have had at one time. Yeah, I guess they were grading, they, you know, they were grading this so quickly. And they might have been doing that at the same time they were trying to twist the arm of Sewickley's council to approve it. Mm -hmm. Chris, uh, Christian, yes, thank you very ahead. much. Christian, thank you very much for organizing this. And George, thank you for presenting it. You're sure welcome. Thing. Thank you. All right. I think we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, thank you again to George for uh, doing all this research. And thank you to everybody for joining us tonight. And thank you to those of you who donated uh, during tonight's registration process. We really, really appreciate that. Um, I hope you can join us again for another one of these in the future. And again, if you have a program that you'd like to share, reach out to me. You can find my email address in the uh, confirmation emails that you got for tonight's program. All right. We hope to see you again soon. Have a great night, everybody. Good night, all. Good night. Bye, guys.